All right, today we're going to hit um, a lot of different places. We're going to go all the way from Asia across to India. and We're going to end up in Europe and, and, and finish off in Mesoamerica. So we've got a lot to do. I call it the birth of the modern world because we almost get everything accomplished and that we're going to get ourselves ready for Global 2 content and set a strong foundation going forward. Because it's so much, well, let's get going. So we start with some Chinese dynasties. We'll start with the Mongol Empire, which is also known as the Yuan Dynasty. And to understand that, you need to know a little bit about Temujin, who is Genghis Khan. He was uh, born in war in many ways, you know, between the rival tribe, the Merkits, who poisoned his father. He was taken a prisoner by his own people who betrayed him as soon as, you know, when he was a young boy and he grew up. He made friends with his blood brother, Jamuka. His, his blood brother helped him get his wife back. He eventually uh, decided not to join his blood brother, so his blood brother got angry at him and he ended up having to fight his blood brother. He uh, was enslaved and Temujin's going to be enslaved a, a number of times, as many as three different times on occasion he'll be enslaved. And he will eventually use all of that vengeance and anger and he becomes known as Genghis Khan, the leader of the uh, Mongolian people. And he's going to unite the tribes together. He's going to uh, make sure that he uses meritocracy to run his his empire that is that he's going to choose people who are really fit and strong to rule his kingdom and help him rule and he is going to inspire terror amongst the people that he fights so to know about the mongols know they ride on horseback uh, excellent archers very good with stirrups to hold themselves in place they have this nature worship with their god tengri and they have a very much a Viking-like warrior culture, you know, taking out other people's things. The Mongol Empire is the largest land empire that we will study and the largest land empire continuously in history. So, the, the empire, something like 11 million miles continuous. Genghis Khan is a great, powerful leader of the Mongols, however... His sons may not be as, as great as he was. Kublai Khan, pretty good, but as the line goes on and they live in luxury, I think those same dynastic control kind of falls apart. And they call themselves the Yuan Dynasty, okay? So there we are, Yuan Dynasty. Now, what are the Mongols famous for? They're famous for their ability to control the Silk Road. Marco Polo will comment on all the luxury goods that they're able to hone in on. It said that you could like take gold over your head and walk on this, this, you know, quote unquote Silk Road. It's not really one road, but a series and network of roads. But if you were to walk or ride your camel, you would be untouched and unscathed because the Mongols are a very violent individual group who will punish the thievery to the extreme. So the Silk Roads opened up, therefore cultural diffusion is spread. Not saying they tried to do that, but that's what happens. The bubonic plague is also spread as a result. So when we think about cultural diffusion, is it positive, is it negative? Well, there's some positives, but disease would be a certain negative. The, the yam system is like our Pony Express, uh, when you think of America. Gets the news out, and if someone were to rebel, then you can use the yam system to spread the word and put them in their place. Their government system based on merit. That's why it's so effective. You have people who are actually qualified who run the government system. Reminds you of Confucianism. Demands tribute. Reminds you of Persia. You know, Royal Road. Think that kind of stuff. However, they did not force people to convert their religion because they felt like their religion was native to their steppe climate, which had very harsh winters and hot summers. So they said, you know, they can't. They can't convert to our religion. They don't. They don't live where we live. They don't come where, from where we come. And there are some examples of the Mongols uh, failing. I mean, you know, not many, but here's one example at least. So their their fall has contributed to their size. Uh, think of the Alexander the Great. Like the empire just got too big in combination with rulers who were not like the founders, okay? Not everyone's a Timujin who grows up in war and fire and brimstone, you know? And it, so it splits into to four kingdoms. Reminds me of Macedon, right? The fall of Alexander.
They also failed to take Japan, not once, but twice, and Japan was preserved by those famous storms over there, those kamikaze storms. Hold on to that thought, because when we go to World War II, you're going to need that kamikaze knowledge, okay? So, after the Yuan fall comes the Ming Dynasty, and the Ming Dynasty are going to use a powerful technology to take back their empire as they see it. So, using the gun, the red turbans, as they were called, force back the Mongols and defeat them using the guns. They aren't super accurate. They explode sometimes um, when they're not supposed to and hurt people as a result. But the ability to have a gun and the ability to use it in ranged warfare is essential to the Red Turban movement. And they install an emperor, Ming Hong Hu, and Ming Hong Hu lives in the forbidden city of Beijing, where you must ask for permission if you were to enter that city. Now let's connect Shi Huangdi to the Ming Dynasty. Remember Shi Huangdi built the Great Wall? Well, he didn't finish it, so the Ming are going to finish it, and you need to understand why. They do that because they're so afraid that the Mongols are going to come back. They need this Great Wall to protect them, and so that's why they build it something like 5,500 miles long. The Ming are also famous, at least in the early history, of spreading some trade. They are going to sail Zheng He out about seven times, and he's going to come back with all these different animals and all of these different spices. And he uses a junk ship, which is a, a ship that has a really, really strong construction and many, many sails, so it's able to really grab the wind and go. And so he's sailing around, he's meeting different countries, and then you see some of China's ethnocentrism pop around. Remember back in the Shang Dynasty, they said they're the Middle Kingdom, the center of the world, essentially. Well, they go back and they start calling other nations uh, little brothers. That's what they call them. And so you know, it's like, you're my little brother or something. Very um, ethnocentric term, meaning they think they're the best. And so they cut off exploration of Zheng He because they felt like it was waste, uh, a waste of time. You know, their culture is so much superior to others. Why bother? And so eventually the Ming are going to fall, much like the other dynasties do, where the taxes just start to get higher and higher. You get a corrupt government and different factions. There's some disease going on. And eventually a peasant revolt sort of takes this and destroys this dynasty. And in its wake is a new group of people who call themselves the Manchus. They hail from the north and you know, reminds you of the Mongols in some sense, very warlike people, able to, to master horses and things like that. And they're going to take over in the north and form a new dynasty called the Qing dynasty. And the Qing dynasty, remember Q is a CH in, in, in our um, you know, translation here. And they expand upon the empire, taking in Mongolia, where they're from, and... Um, or Manchuria, I should say, and what they're going to do is they're going to spread their um, power, and they're going to do it through their use of the Manchu bannermen, which are very elite military strategy that they use. So, but they they rule with a minority. I mean, about three percent of the population is Manchu, and ninety-seven percent of the population would be your standard uh, Han Chinese, as they would refer to themselves. Okay, the Han Chinese, going back to the golden age of Chinese culture, it, for them at least is is the Han Dynasty, and so they they refer to themselves as Han Chinese, whereas the Manchu are very uh, very much different. So, something like two or three percent of the population are the Manchus, and they're going to hold top government positions. They they are going to have a unique language, a unique dress style, so that they can show that they are much different, much different from the Han majority. So there's your like Manchu women, you know, very elite dress and very different from the from the regular Han people. And if you look, they even made the Han people have to, you know, adopt these pigtails, as we'll call them, so that they have to wear those and, and be a mark of what uh, the, the, the Han people are. So even just making them dress differently and look differently so that you know who's who. The Canton system is brilliant, and it's a strong system, although Britain will take this down eventually. And this is one of the things that helps to keep the Manchu alive, because they are wealthy. They have this thing called the Canton system. There's one port, you go through that one port, you tax everything coming into the country, 
they put the Han Chinese in positions to collect these taxes, you know, uh, and then the Canton system ensures that everyone who is on top stays very, very, very wealthy and, um, you know, supports the emperor and all that kind of stuff. And you can pay a strong army. If you have money, you pay that army, the army stays strong, and that's the system that keeps them around for a number of years. However, some craziness is going to happen. Uh, number one, there's a peasant rebellion called the White Lotus Rebellion. Now, I'm not saying that this is the thing that's going to break them. I, I don't think that it is, but it's just the start. It's the, the latter rebellion called the Taiping Rebellion, where this shows their weakness. And this is at the same time that, that Britain will start to bring in opium into the country. And so there's like this addiction compounded with this rebellion. And the leader of this rebellion is pretty wacky. His name is Hong Xiaoxuan. And Hong Xiaoxuan is going to lead a rebellion. He believes himself to be the brother of Jesus Christ. Yes, the brother of Jesus Christ who, you know, died, what, 1800 years ago. And he believes that uh, he needs to spread Christianity and it's going to take millions of dollars to put down this rebellion of Hong Xiaoxuan, shown there. Uh, you can make an argument that it's the first communist revolution in the sense that it preached equality and it uh, tried to share the wealth and create a you know, something of a commune system. The uh, gender equality is what he was striving for. And so together, Hong Xiaoxuan is going to uh, try to bring the peasants together in something of an early communist revolution. There's a lot more to that, but suffice it to say, I think it's an interesting point. He also uh, went to the extremes and believed that he had to kill the Manchu people entirely, which... You know, kind of reminds you of the Karl Marx idea of killing all the rich, right? The, sin, the difference is, of course, is that he's going with an ethnic cleansing, which is, in our terms today, genocide, right? What he's trying to do. So Hong Xiaoxuan is eventually put down, but it, it really does weaken the people. And because of this rebellion, other nations are going to come in and feast on China. More on that in just a little bit. So with China Week, we're going to go on and carry our story to the Middle East. And in the Middle East, you've got the Ottoman Empire, an empire that is Islamic, an empire that controls the Middle East, it controls the Holy Land, and it starts to spread even up through the Balkan Mountains into the area of Bosnia, Croatia, Hungary. If you're looking over here, like south of Poland, all of these little states where Greece is to the north, they have got a lot of territory and a very powerful uh, little empire that's being built. And they use the Janissaries to do it, a group of slave soldiers who are powerful and good at ranged warfare. They get some of that gunpowder from China, utilize it to make the cannon, and eventually take over the city of Constantinople. Remember Justinian's dream? Remember the Hagia Sophia? That's all sort of remade. It's renamed the whole entire city is Istanbul. So it's not you're not going to see Constantinople on a map of present day. It's Istanbul. And the Hagia Sophia is not the Eastern Orthodox Church that you saw. Now it is a Muslim mosque where, where uh, people who are Muslim will pray to Allah and Muhammad and all that kind of stuff. Okay? Famous ruler right there. Uh, Suleiman the Magnificent is able to expand his empire through, through gunpowder, what we'll call the Gunpowder Empire. And he is famous for taking his empire through a golden age that we'll call Pax Ottomanica. If uh, Rome had the Pax Romana era, then Suleiman's going to have Pax Ottomanica. You've got art, literature, science being reborn. Sometimes you'll see him called Suleiman the lawgiver instead of the magnificent, just because he really believed in spreading his, his law system throughout his kingdom and creating a kingdom that has one unified law system. He used some of the religious elements of the Quran to help spread what we call Sharia law. Okay, so he is he's about spreading the law system of the Quran. This also is buttressed by the idea that he would expect that you follow these laws, but at the same time did allow you to practice your own religion on the side so that he had some toleration and would have less rebellions. This is an example of religious toleration, which I cannot stress how important that is in ruling an empire. Now, how do they fall? Well, they're not going to fall until World War I, but just looking at their empire and how large it is, eventually it's going to come crashing down. They control an area known as the Balkans, which 
many Christians live, and those Christians are eventually going to want to rebel and take back their land. And it's just such a diverse place that they're trying to rule that it will it will basically collapse under its own weight. Reminds you of the Yuan Dynasty, what we'll call the Mongols, right? It's the same idea, just the empire got too, too big. So, World War I, that's a nice setup punch for you. They call the Ottoman Empire the sick old man of Europe before World War I. Why? Because it was a sick and dying empire that's going to collapse following the First World War. Hold on to that piece of knowledge. We're going to be going back to that next year in Global 2, sometime in January. Okay. Now, let's head into India. Again, going fast here. India, Mughal Empire. What does that sound like? Oh my gosh, Mongols, right? Sounds like Mongols because it's the Mongols who are going to come in and take over the India, at least indirectly. And so you've got something that you should know about India. I always like to like give you something that you can, can build on. And so to build your knowledge, let's start with your foundation, right? You should know this like the back of your hand. In Hinduism, you must follow your Dharma. Keep good karma to reach moksha okay check out the rap if you forgot you should not forget that right so in hinduism you should know that god can take many forms uh, sometimes god is vishnu sometimes god is brahma sometimes god is is shiva but in all cases god is 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 shape-shifting in many ways you have got the holy text of the vedas and you should know that there's a caste system in india functions similar to the European feudal system. That is that where you're born is where you stay, okay? Where you're born is where you stay. Very limited social mobility. It's hard to move up in the caste system because technically you got to die and be reborn through what we call reincarnation. So that's a little bit about India. Let's go on and let's talk about these Mughals. So the Mughals are founded by a descendant of Genghis Khan whose name is Babur. I'm not expecting you to memorize that. I just want you to know there's some Mongol blood here, just like everywhere, right? At age 14, Babur's grandson Akbar took the throne, and Akbar is the most important leader to know when we talk about the, the Mughal Empire. They create a language of a mixture of Persian Arabic. That sounds to me like a, a little mixing, so I would say that's cultural diffusion for you. And the Mughals are going to build ta the Taj Mahal. Most of their leaders are Muslim, so it's a Muslim minority ruling a Hindu majority. What could go wrong there, right? And they're going to initially, at least, respect Indian and Persian art and sort of blend that together. Kind of like what Alexander did with his Hellenistic empire, his, his huge Macedonian empire. There's a lot of freedom of expression going on between the different cultures. And the Taj Mahal is a good example of just that building together of, of, of cultures. Really beautiful place. How do they run their government? Well, they are going to try their best to uh, gain the favor of some of those Indian princes, putting them in some, some pretty important government positions, like the Qing did, right? You put a couple of people in some, some fairly important government positions to keep them happy. They are going to uh, use the Zamindar system, essentially collecting taxes. This uh, tax system is going to function like a tribute system would. You're going to go out there, you're going to collect tribute, you're going to bring it back to, to Akbar or whoever the ruler is at the time. So when we look at Indian rulers, you should know that there's some good and there's some bad. Okay, Akbar the Great, it's actually Akbar means the great, so it's like saying the great the great. He is known for his religious toleration. He doesn't put a tax on it. He just says, you know, have your own religion, you know, go wild, you know what I mean? He's going to be very good in money and management, although he does not like rebellions. He's got some of that Mongol in him. And so when a city rebels, he just destroys it all. Reminds you of what Genghis would do, right? Temujin would slaughter an entire city if they even so much as winked at him wrong. And that's kind of what Akbar is doing you know, to that ferocity level. He's also infamous for the special house where he put all these babies in and said, you know, they you can't speak to them because language is innate. You're born with it. And so you don't have to learn it. It was like this weird scientific experiment. He was trying to see if you really need to to be taught language or if it just happened and turns out he was wrong and so all those babies he put into the special house uh, it took him a long time for them to, to learn a, lang a language again really weird stuff okay on the other side 
uh, RNZ would be another leader to just have a you know inkling about. Again, I'm not going to have you memorize it, but it's good to bring up this kind of stuff. So RNZ is going to outlaw sati, which is where a widow, so if your husband dies, you are expected to throw yourself on the funeral pyre and essentially kill yourself in a, in a burning flame. Of course, men were never expected to do that if their wife died. He was known to be very frugal. He outlawed drinking and gambling. He really tried to, to clean up the morals. However, he was not tolerant. He forced you to convert. He tried to force Sharia law. He was a Muslim. He lets you know he was a Muslim, and he wants you to, to be a part of his religion. So not as tolerant as Akbar. Okay? Now, where does this come in? I'm going to link India and China together through this flower here. And that flower is the poppy flower. And essentially what happened was, is Britain showed up with their joint stock companies and they saw that the Mughal Empire was created based on inequality. The idea being that the few, the, the people who are Muslims, the people who follow Islam are on top and the many, the Hindu people, well, they are on the bottom and, and Britain felt like they could, they could use that to their advantage. So they used a strategy where they would come in bit by bit, gain some wealth, and then they started to use a divide and conquer strategy. They pit the Muslims against the Hindus and then use that to take more and more power and bit by bit eventually showed the world that because they were so divided that Britain needed to be there to keep the peace. And we'll talk more about that in Global 2, but essentially what they did is, is by pitting the, the Hindus against the Muslims, they came out on top. Then they used the land to be farms for the poppy flower so that they could grow poppy in mass quantities. And then what they did is they refined it and shipped it over to China and force fed it to China as part of what we will call the opium wars. China tried to stop the importation of opium, and Britain just kept on pushing it down their throats. So, from the Mughal Empire and the Qing Dynasty, the connection is, is that Great Britain is going to use the Indian Empire, the Mughals, to grow poppy to send across to China. Okay? Now... With all of uh, uh, those different places done, we're going to go on to Europe, and then we'll finish up with Mesoamerica. We're doing good. So, in Europe, let's talk about the rise of nation states. But first, to do that, you've got to know about the commercial revolution, which is a shift from the barter economy to using money. Once you have money, that allows you to have patronage. If people have money, they can go out and they can purchase art. A patron is someone who buys art. So... You've got like Pericles in Athens, right? He bought art and encouraged art. So that's what's going to happen in Europe. And as a result, we get a rebirth. After the horrors of the bubonic plague, you get a rebirth and what we call the Renaissance. And let's talk about the Renaissance. The Renaissance is based in humanism. The idea that men, humans are awesome and that we need to study them. And we need to make our statues and our paintings all about the human body not necessarily got to be perfect in the sense of the greeks and romans right the eight packs okay but to capture the essence of humanity we are cool and we need to study and we need to make paintings and sculptures about us and there's also this belief in what we call secularism, which I'd argue is around today in, in droves. Secularism is to focus on the here and now, not necessarily the afterlife. Like what's going to happen when you go to heaven or, or whatever else you believe in, okay? Doesn't matter. Secularists say, let's focus on what are we living um, and going through right now. So to study the Renaissance, really you just got to know your Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. If you can do that, you can do a great job with the, with the Renaissance. So let's talk about, you know, the different uh, different turtles. Let's start with, uh, we've got to talk about the purple, who is Donatello, uh, Michelangelo in the orange, Raphael in the red, and then of course Leonardo in the blue. But when we talk about Leonardo, we're talking about Leonardo da Vinci, okay? So let's do it. First, Donatello. 
sculptures, okay? Beautiful, beautiful sculptures for Donatello, for uh, Leonardo. He's going to uh, be famous for the Mona Lisa, for, for the different uh, awesome drawings he's got here, an early submarine, perhaps an early tank, uh, the so, reloading crossbow that has a bolt so that you can, you can fasten it a lot quicker, an early flying machine. He was imaginative. He created some really cool stuff. Other people to know would be Michelangelo in the famous Sistine Chapel. He had a lot of neck pain afterwards because he was painting up on top of scaffolds and he had to lay down to do it. Really rough stuff, but beautiful. Other people, Raphael, more paintings and beautiful ones. You know, more than more than I can show in this slideshow. Now, there are other painters that we should talk about. First, let's talk about Durer. And Durer is famous because he is about everyday life. He captured the secular attitude of the Renaissance. I mean, look at this painting. It's just, here's a harvest. Here's what everyday life is like. Aren't we so beautifully awesome as human beings? This is the life that we live. Let's capture it. Let's live it. Let's love it. And in literature, we've got Cervantes, who pokes fun at the knights of the Middle Ages. And so he, he's writing a satire, a very funny satire at, at that. Shakespeare, he's writing about the human emotions of love and joy and, and, and even some of the, the, the backstabbing, you know, thinking of Macbeth right? So capturing the human experience. And Machiavelli even tries to, to add on to this and talk about, you know, how do humans manipulate their political sphere? And he comes up with a concept that it is better to be feared than loved as a ruler, right? So they, you want your people to fear you so that they never rebel. So those are some of the, the writers that we must understand if we are to really have a good grasp of, of what the Renaissance is trying to do, which is to pull our attention away from the religious aspects of, of focusing on the afterlife and focusing on the present day. Now, uh, furthermore, I think that the Renaissance allows something like this to happen when we talk about Martin Luther and the Protestant Reformation. And essentially, Martin Luther is walking home one day when he nearly is struck by, by lightning, and he has this moment where he begs the saints, he says, please, please help me, and if you do, if you spare my life, I will devote myself to being a monk. And so he takes the haircut, he becomes a monk, and bit by bit as a monk, he starts to see a couple of things that bother him. And number one is the that the priests have this whole sermon but it's it's not in german it's in it's in latin and very few people can actually understand it he's a german monk himself and he knows that the common people understand german not latin and so that that really starts to bother him he also tripped takes a trip over to the vatican and he sees that some of the priests are engaging in, in awful gambling and prostitution and he says that this is clearly wrong this is not what priests are supposed to do this supposed to be the best of the people and then lastly, he sees uh, the scene here, which are the sale of indulgences. And an indulgence is basically a passport that you are given to heaven in some ways, a, a way to, to get yourself out of the possible purgatory, which is like the halfway house between heaven and hell, and, and to save your uh, past grandparents or your parents from, from purgatory, that you can give a sum of gold to the Catholic Church and they will give you a ticket that says you are out of purgato purgatory, we, we forgive your sins, and that's it. He says that's wrong, that's not the Catholic Church's teachings at all, and the Catholic Church is just trying to make money. And so he comes together and he nails a famous 95 theses on the wall, basically 95 reasons why the Catholic Church needs to get its act together. 95 different things it's doing that, that can be done better. And, uh, you know, one of his gripes, for example, is that is that he feels it's wrong that the Catholic Church is punishing those who take their own life. He says, you know, these people who commit suicide are you know, terribly saddened and, and guilt-ridden, and, and we don't need to punish them further by not even burying them with, with the rest of our flock. And so, you know, Martin Luther is coming from this very human perspective, and once he does this and he starts speaking out against the Catholic Church, he is called to Rome. And at Rome, they say, listen, you're, you're going to recant, you're going to take back the words that you have said about the Catholic Church, indulgences are fine, you know, shut your mouth, and go on, and and be quiet for the rest of your days. 
And he says, no, my conscience can't allow me to do that. And they, you know, they're starting to threaten him with the Spanish Inquisition. You know, they torture you to death if you, if you don't um, convert. And he holds fast. He ends up having to hide. And uh, while he's hiding, he translates the Bible into German so the average person can, can read it. And Martin Luther, by all accounts, has got this, this belief in, in a new faith, a faith called Protestantism. And this, this Protestantism has the root word of Protestant, or protest, right? The idea that, that this is a religion that is protesting against the Catholic Church. It's outside of the Catholic Church. It does not see the, the Pope as the almighty of the Catholic Church, but instead believes that people uh, can still have a relationship with God outside of the Pope. And, and it's a different kind of structure. And Martin Luther will even have a specific set of Protestant values. And so he is, his set of religion is called the Lutheran uh, Church or Lutheranism, right? We have one right in Lawrence. And uh, the Lutherans believe that through faith alone, one can achieve salvation. That is, you have to have faith in God. Well, Martin Luther, I, I don't believe that he meant for this to happen, but it certainly did. And that is that Martin Luther's ideas create a new church. And some people gravitate to the Protestant church and other people stay in the Catholic church. And instead of uh, agreeing, they see themselves as an, an, like an antithesis, an antihero, and, and they end up fighting um, against one another in bloody wars over religion. And really, his movement, the Protestant Reformation, changes the world because there is now a... A or a B group. You are either a Catholic or a Protestant. If you're a Protestant, you don't like Catholics, and if you're a Catholic, you don't like Protestants. I'm talking about the big politics, okay? Maybe not the everyday person, although for the everyday person, they would fight in these wars. So through faith alone, he believes that he can change the world for better, and I think he watches his ideas actually, actually tear apart the world in some ways. And so not that he meant to, and I'm not saying that it's his fault, I'm just saying that that's what starts to happen, and I think that it hurt him in many ways to see his his views and his ideas turn to violence. I know that that was not something that that, that he uh, you know championed for, at least early on in his movement. So what should you know? You should know some vocab. Know the Protestant Reformation is a turning point in history. It creates another church. The word salvation means the right to go to heaven. Know that the Catholics actually came back with something called the Counter-Reformation. This is getting into like AP Euro, but they, they really started to try to fix some of their, their ideas that they they realized were broken, like indulgences, and they get rid of them. You should know the word anti-Semitism is the hatred of the Jewish people. Know what an absolute monarch is, someone who is an iron fist. Absolute monarchs tended to like Protestantism, not necessarily because of the views, but because the Protestant church does not have a pope, therefore they didn't have to share power with the pope, so they really like that. And indulgence says, we've talked about it, is money given to the church to wipe away sins. So, causes of the Reformation. Well, the Renaissance would be a big one. Because of the Renaissance, we have humanism and glorification of man, and we're starting to look at the church, and, and it opens the door for some criticisms. The absolute monarchs don't like sharing power, so this is a way to get around that. Remember, the Eastern Orthodox Church is kind of exported to, to Russia and kind of stays up there, and it's, it's not as central to Europe as, as maybe you would like. Um, church corruption is, is obviously like a short-term one. It's, it's an idea that all of the practices need to be reformed, especially indulgences. You should know about Martin Luther. Just know that Luther is not the only one. I mean, he goes after Johann Tetzel, a man who sold indulgences. And if I had time to show you the movie Luther, maybe I would. But suffice it to say, Tetzel's going around selling these indulgences. And he, uh, Martin Luther, really didn't like that at all. And so he nails a 95 thesis and says, listen, there are 95 things that you're doing wrong. And indulgences is number one. John Calvin would be another reformer to to at least be aware of. He creates Calvinism, which is a branch of Protestantism. Just like when we have Christianity, there's a branch of Christianity called Catholicism. So Calvinism is a branch of Protestantism. Lutheranism is a branch of Protestantism. Okay, Many of our American forefathers were Protestants, so just to give you an idea of how powerful it is. Um, and Calvin believes in predestination. He says basically that you're already chosen by God when you're born, if you're going to go to heaven or if you're not. And so this is a different branch of, of Protestantism.
Now, how do these ideas come out? Well, the bearded man, Johannes Gutenberg, comes up with the printing press. It builds upon the, I, the Sung idea, Sung China I'm talking, right, of the movable type print. It expands on that and creates the printing press. And the printing press is able to spread Luther's ideas like you wouldn't believe. Without this, there might not be a reformation. So he's able to get the, the Bible translated and then mass copies out so that people can start to read it. And thus literacy rates are going to spike, which I would argue is a good thing. Now we've talked briefly about the response. The response, number one, was violence in terms of wars. Fought between Protestants and Catholics. The counter-reformation's another way. This was like a nice way to deal with it, okay? Maybe the, the more logical way to deal with some of the practices is like, hey, why don't we just reform them? Which is probably what Luther would have, you know, asked for all along. And what he really wanted in the end was just, just to reform, you know, these, these practices. But it didn't happen. The Council of Trent was too late. The Council of Trent did meet, and eventually they did reform the church, but again, just, just too late. They'd already tried to scare Luther into recanting, and, and after that, he just, he just saw the Catholic Church as nothing more than an institution trying to get as much money from the common person as they could, and he just, he just couldn't live with that. Uh, now, I don't spend a lot of time with some of this stuff. I mean, I guess you could spend more time, but I don't know why you would want to. So the Catholic Church launched something called the Inquisition. I'm sure it's something that they're probably very embarrassed of, where they went out and tortured and executed people who did not follow the faith. Now, the Spanish um, Inquisition is something that uh, is taken on by Spain itself. So if you've heard the Inquisition, it's a Catholic Church, but then the Spanish Inquisition, sort of like just in Spain, sort of building on this, because Spain is probably the most militant Catholic nation at this time period. They go after the Jews and destroy their homes. That's that's what we call a pogrom, P-O-G-O-M, a pogrom where you go after these Jewish people. We're going to see this going on in, in Russia in 1905. I mean, it's just, just horrible. And the Jewish people have to face this anti-Semitism. Now, as part of this wing of, of Inquisition, they come up with a militant order um, called the Jesuits. And the Jesuits are sort of like the sword of the Catholic Church, and they go along converting people, sometimes with just the Bible and other times with blades. And, um, you know, you can speculate that a little bit. Um, Jesuits are around today, though I don't think they carry swords anymore, but I'm... I'm I'm just getting you to understand that the Jesuits was a, in some ways, like a crusader warrior branch of, of the Catholic Church, at least in some of its more militant categories. Now, in some categories, it's just missionaries going out and trying to spread the faith, and that's, that's great, but um, worth, worth an understanding. So what are some effects? Uh, definitely, definitely star this, like disunity. There is now a second church in the world, and the second church does not agree with the first church, right? And so if I am Protestant, I am not associating with Catholics. If I'm Catholic, I'm not associating with Protestants. It's going to open up a whole new way of, of, of political intrigue. Uh, the Thirty Years' War is going to occur. Why do you think they call it the Thirty Years' War? I'll wait for it. Yeah, it happened uh, over the course of 30 years. Great. Um, the rise of the anti-Semitic the attitudes in Europe is going to be tangible. We're going to see the Jewish people face a wave of violence because they refuse to convert. The Muslims are also going to be expelled from Spain, uh, called the Reconquista. And the Reconquista is uh, not as fun as it sounds because it's a religious war and a bloody war against the Moors or the Muslims of, of Spain. So Spain actually takes this Inquisition, goes full blown, and actually kicks out anybody who is not Catholic, which is which is a pretty you know nasty example of of religious intolerance. Okay, now. After the Protestant Reformation, we start to see the rise of different nation states. And why am I showing you this map? Because I think it will help you sort of start to see where we are come Global 2. Okay, because remember, this is my last unit with you guys. So you're going to see absolute monarchs take power. England, France, Spain, where they are trying to dominate and create alliances that will reign true. And England and France are going to be at the center of these conflicts because England is Protestant. And if you want to take a guess at what France is, yeah, they're Catholic. Okay, Catholics are only Protestants and Protestants are only Catholics. So here we go. So in France, 
the British nearly defeat the French until Joan of Arc rises up and says, you know, first, number one, I've been chosen by God to make sure that I put a Catholic monarch on the throne. And number two, let me rally these people. She eventually dies. She dies a martyr, however. She dies a martyr because she is trying to save her nation and save Catholicism as she believes. Um, in France, I want you to know a little bit about their economic system and their political system. So they have a legislative body like our Senate called the Estates General, though it rarely ever met. The king made most of the decisions. He didn't consult the Estates General too often. But when he did, the estate system was very skewed. The first estate made up about a percent of the population, and then the nobles made up about 2%, and the peasants made up 97%. So 97, two, one on the top, okay? Every estate had one vote. So first estate has one vote, second estate has one vote, third estate has one vote. It sounds really fair, but when you look at the poor percent population, here's what starts to happen. The clergy and the nobles, or the aristocracy, if you want to throw a college term out there, okay, um, what they can do is they can vote together on any issue and overrule the third estate at any time. Because if the clergy votes one, and the nobles vote one, that's two. And then if the nobles, um, you know, and in, in they ally with the with the church, then the commoners, the peasants, are always overruled because two is more than one, right? And so the king at the time, Louis XIV, kept this alive, and it's this unequal system that produces high taxes for the third estate. There's Louis XIV. He called himself the Sun King. He felt like the, uh, the world needed to revolve around him, that his people needed to revolve their lives around him and making his life awesome. And he believed in divine right as well, that you know, sort of believers appointed the Sun King. He built this place. Yeah, that place, the Palace of Versailles, that's for him. And he brought his nobles here so he could watch over them and make sure they weren't doing crazy. The gardens are beautiful. I've been here. It is breathtaking and awe-striking how gorgeous the Palace of Versailles is. I didn't feel worthy walking through these places, okay? Um, now, let's talk about England. England's got a, a separate history, and England's got the history of the Magna Carta. They have a king who has a little bit of limited power, just a little bit, but enough. He's going to have to ask the parliament a lot more often than the estates general in France. So he has to ask the parliament, which parliament's made up of nobles. Don't want you to think that that's total equality, okay? That still means that the peasants are not being heard in England as well. However, the nobles are have, are like a check on the king in some ways, so he has to ask the nobles before raising taxes. And this was adopted during King John's reign. Now, uh, common law is something that also exists in England. So in France, laws are different north to south. In England, you're supposed to have one set of laws, all north, all south, they all have the same laws, which, you know, sounds like, you know, that's the way it should be. So the common law was adopted. And a lot of common law ends up in American law, like our tort law and stuff like that. Okay. Henry VIII is somebody that we should understand and know a little bit about. Henry VIII had six wives. Henry VIII had six wives because he was looking for a male heir, could not get one, and we know that that's actually a problem with the male, not a problem with the female, but you know, that, you couldn't tell Henry that. Okay, And in Catholicism, you're not allowed to divorce your wife. So when Henry VIII was Catholic, okay, he couldn't divorce these wives. So he's like technically like having extramarital affairs, I guess. And so what he does is he decides, well, that's not working for me. So I'll just do what Martin Luther did and create um, my own church so that I can have a son. And so he calls it the Anglican Church or the Church of England. And that Church of England allows you to divorce. Go figure, right? And so he creates this whole church so that he can have a son. And um, that would be our, our key difference that I want you to know about between Anglicanism and Catholicism. Anglicanism is a branch of the Protestant faith, okay? Just like in, in Christianity, you know, Catholicism is a branch, okay? Anglicanism is a branch of the Protestant faith. And I know it's weird because all of these religions, they all believe in the core ideas of God and Jesus and all of those things, but there's slight differences. And I'm not trying to you know, bring you into theology or something, but, but to get you used to these words, I think it's a big deal. 
Now, Henry VIII does have a daughter. His daughter is Elizabeth. He did not like Elizabeth, ashamed of her, did not like her, did not think that she would ever be anything. And lucky for him, she didn't listen to anything he said. She was awesome, okay? Elizabeth is able to defeat the most powerful Catholic king to date, uh, King Philip of Spain. She smashes his famous fleet called the Spanish Armada using fire ships. She gets a storm. It's a little bit of luck, but a lot of skill, and she's able to push out the Spanish. So, with all of that, uh, we're going to talk about Elizabeth next year, but knowing that she's a Protestant queen, she was a moderate. She said, if you want to be Catholic, you go right ahead, buddy. As long as you're uh, protecting me in England, I'm happy. Okay? So, with Europe down, we got Mesoamerica. So, without further ado, let's look at the birth of the modern world, Mesoamerica. So, to start, let's talk about the different civilizations that existed before Europe came and, and colonized areas. And to do that, we'll talk about the Aztecs first. We're talking about Mexico here, all right? Fierce warriors, modern-day Mexico, and they have a capital city called Tenochtitlan. Tenochtitlan. Beautiful, right? I mean, amazing, really, given the time period we're talking about here, 1500. They built it on a, on a lake, which is absolutely amazing. Just you know, thinking about that, like this whole city on a lake. And there's the Aztec Empire. Okay. So how do they do it? Well, number one, they are a fierce warrior group who demands tribute from the nearly 30 million people they conquer. And so the tribute is a mixture of gold and also human um, tribute. They believe that their gods could end the world at any time. And so they demanded that people would give their human capital to the Aztecs so that they could sacrifice them to the gods and the emperor ruled as the son of the sun. Here are some of the religious temples. Just gorgeous, right? And they are a polytheistic people who practice human sacrifice. Uh, Huitzilopochtli is their god. Something that looks like this. Okay. And they have other gods like Quetzalcoatl. The feathered serpent who strangely looks like the Pokemon Rayquaza. And some of their achievements. Number one, uh, their doctors are able to set broken bones, treat dental cavities. I mean, they they're are advanced in some ways uh, in terms of their medicine. They have a, a entire city built on a lake. If that doesn't scream advanced, then I don't know what else does. Okay, 200,000 people in a city. That's just uh, really impressive. They have the chinampas, which are the floating gardens, and they use that to increase their food supply. Literally just doing what they've got to do to master the geography and elements that are given to them. So there are some chinampas. And what will happen is, is that the conquerors are going to use some of their polytheistic religion against them, essentially arguing that they are the gods. Uh, I believe uh, Hernan Cortes said that he was Quetzalcoatl in human form and uh, used that as a way to manipulate the emperor at the time, Montezuma, into getting him uh, into the temple of Montezuma and getting close enough to, to basically take the leader ransom hostage and show that Montezuma was weak and therefore the Aztecs would rebel and they actually killed Montezuma. They stoned Montezuma to death right in front of, of Hernan Cortes. So he quite literally you know, cut the head off the snake, if you will. So there he is, Hernan Cortes. He is going to realize that the rival tribes hate the Aztecs. He uses some of them to defeat the Aztecs. You know, basically a divide and conquer strategy. It reminds you of like Britain, for example, when they conquered India. And Hernan Cortes also has something that the, uh, the the British did not have when they went over to India, which is which is the germs angle. Okay, they both have guns, they both have steel, but the germs angle. He is bringing smallpox. At first, not knowing so, but the smallpox is going to ravage the Aztec Empire, and because they're so close, it's going to spread like a wildfire. The Europeans are inoculated against it. The Aztecs have their immune system; it just has never seen it, and so it's just terrifying how brutal it is. He also uses the natives to their advantage. He he meets a woman, uh, La Malinche, and she is going to lead him through and act as an interpreter for him and she becomes the benedict arnold of the native people so that's the aztecs 
Again, we're going to go fast, so we're going to go through the Incan people who live on that mountain range. What's that mountain range, of course? But the Andes Mountains. Very good. And the Andes Mountains are going to require that they are uh, very creative in terms of how they use their geography. They create a capital city called Cusco, uh, a forbidden city known as Machu Picchu, which is really cool, up in the clouds. To run their system, they have something called Kipu. They rule um, by an emperor who is the son of the sun, like the Aztecs. But Kipu is really cool. It's a knotted string system so that they could collect tax money and revenue and keep track of the different revenues being sent. So Kipu is a way to, to, to collect money and collect taxes. Their culture is polytheistic. Their language is called Quechua, but Quechua is not a written down language. And a lot of the languages have been destroyed by the conquerors anyway. So it's very difficult to know a lot about these cultures. And that's why some of the evidence is sparse and the details are sparse, um, meaning I don't have as much details maybe I would like to give you. Now they have a sun god, they are polytheistic, and instead of chinampas, because they're not living in, on the water, like the Aztecs, they're living in the mountains, so they develop terrace farming. Uh, you see terrace farming there. They cut into the mountain, and then they grow on every layer so that they maximize the amount of arable land they have, the amount of farmland they have. They are doing surgery, just like the Aztecs are advanced with their medicine, the Incan are advanced in terms of the surgery they are be able to do on head wounds, they're using antiseptics to clean wounds, they have got a road system, so think like Persia, think like uh, the Roman roads, right, wherever Rome went, a road followed, okay, they're using that road system to collect taxes and tribute, and it's a brilliant system that works really, really well in the mountains, it's a huge, huge empire. So, and imagine you know, cutting through and using those roads. So what they had to invent was a system where you had to devote a certain number of years to the government so that you would work for the government for a couple of years as an Incan citizen. It was just a requirement that you did. It was just like, you know, you're going to do this. So that's the systems that they walked into. And we talked about Hernan Cortez. So we'll talk about some of the other conquerors. But the Spanish come in with three things on their mind, the three Gs. God, gold, and glory. And if you can understand those three things, you, you sort of get the main reasons for, for, con for the conquest of, of uh, Mesoamerica. Number one, to spread the faith of God, uh, to gain as much gold as they could, and to make people remember their names, glory. Okay? So how did they even get here is a good question. And to do that, you got to look at these two people right there, Ferdinand and Isabella. Ferdinand and Isabella were approached by an Italian, Christopher Columbus, who had also went to like every other place, you know, around the world, went to, you know, the Dutch, went to the British. He went to a bunch of different nations and basically asked, like, can you give me some ships? Because I think the world looks like a pear, okay? And I think that the world is smaller than we think it is. And I think that I can get around to India very quick and get access to the spice trade because Portugal had already taken the spice trade by sailing around the tip of, of Africa. So that was sort of like in the way. So because of that, because Bartolome Diaz had, had, had gone around the tip of South Af Africa and had owned that trade, Portugal had owned that trade, yes, sail for the Portuguese, Columbus said, well, if I, if I sail outward, I can find you a new route to the spice trade that's going to be easier and better for you. And that might have been a pretty good selling point, except for the fact that it wasn't enough for the Spanish Catholics. Well, Columbus it took him three times, so he finally realized what's motivating this Catholic crown, what, what's going to make them tick. And Ferdinand, more of a pragmatic, practical dude. But Isabella, she used to walk with a uh, white dress through the battlefield after the Reconquista, where she did, you know, led a expulsion of all Muslims from her country and you know all these religious wars. Well, she used to walk through the, the battlefield in a white dress, and the dress would like soak up the blood. And so she wanted the world to be Catholic, and he knew that. You know, Christopher Columbus knew that. So he drove on that and said, listen, I will spread the faith. You will be able to spread the faith worldwide, and it's going to be beautiful. And he, he sort of spoke to what she wanted. Okay, you speak to your audience as a good speaker, right? And so he got the ships, the three ships, he sailed around the world, and he ended up uh, not reaching the Indies. Instead, he landed on the island of Hispaniola, which is actually Cuba today. And when he landed there, he met the natives, the Tainos, and he began to slaughter the Tainos after finding out that they didn't have enough gold. He brought some of them back as slaves, and he began this invasion that we call the Age of Exploration. I would argue we should call it the Age of Conquest. And so men like Hernan Cortez, the killer, is going to go after the Aztecs. Uh, 
He uses that, like we talked about with Montezuma, told him he was the god of Quetzalcoatl uh, in human form, and he ends up taking over Tenochtitlan after a horrible plague of smallpox, after destroying Montezuma, and he calls it Mexico City. Um, you know, something that just clicked into my head, you know, the Romans, they used to create a wasteland and call it peace. And I think that's what they're kind of doing here. They're, they're making a wasteland and calling it peace. Francisco Pizarro is going to make a wasteland of the Incan people by spreading smallpox. He eventually gets what's coming to him. His men are going to turn on him. But the point is, is that he creates a city known as Lima, Peru, and he is going to take all of that Incan wealth and take it out. He, um, uh, the Incan were famous for the silver, so the Aztecs had the gold, and then the Incan had the silver. He's going to siphon off a lot of that silver back to Spain. Now, as they're in these areas, there becomes a huge debate between two guys, Sepulveda of Spain and Bartolome de la Casas of Spain. And de la Casas is arguing with Sepulveda. Sepulveda says, natives have no souls. Therefore, you can do whatever you want to them, enslave them, kill them, murder them. It doesn't matter. Okay, I know it's a, it's a crazy argument that someone would make that argument is it's just beyond beyond me. But that's what the argument was. It's like they have no soul, so you can do whatever you want to. Where Bartolome de la Casas is like, are you are you kidding me? You idiot! No, they 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 have souls. They're human beings, and we should treat them like brothers. And and this you know sort of claim is is the argument that he says, and he, he goes up to the Catholic monarch, and he goes up to Ferdinand Isabel, and he's like, listen, he says, if you don't stop this. Right? If you don't end this, and it wasn't Ferdinand and Isabella, because at this time it's 1550, but you get the idea. He goes to the Spanish monarch, whoever was sitting on the throne at that time, and he says, listen, if you don't stop this, if you don't stop the carnage that is this age of exploration, right, we're all going to hell for this. That's what he's saying to the, to the Spanish monarch. And, you know, God bless his soul for doing it. He, he really stepped outside and, and called it out. Okay. Now, does that mean that they stopped immediately? No, but, but he... He stood up for what he believed in, and for that we should recognize him, okay? He wrote a book called The Devastation of the Indies. In class, I read it to you. It's awful. It's terrible. And um, honestly, you know, do yourself a favor and don't read it unless you got it. He believes that Spain would be punished for their sins. He believes that Christopher Columbus, who opens the door for, for this, this, you know, exploration, has done something quite terrible. He hated Columbus. He was with Columbus along for the voyage and did not like a thing that he did because he recognized this guy was a murderer and an idiot. Um, the Spanish monarchs recognized this guy was terrible and actually recalled him back to Spain and said, you're, you just, you're not fit for, for governing this island of, of Hispaniola. You're brutal. You're cruel. And so, uh, Christopher Columbus was actually recalled towards the end of his days. Um, know about Diaz because Diaz kind of spurs this idea that there needs to be a new route to the um, to the to the Indies and because he's able to find this route and control this route it really um, you know is is a is a reason why they really develop that that crossing of the Atlantic Ocean because Portugal owns the tip of South Africa it it makes more sense for them to really try to to develop this trade route across and overseas um, other people you should know about would be Ferdinand Magellan who actually sails all the way around the world and going all the all the way and, and circumnavigating the globe now in elementary school they talk to you about the Colombian exchange this exchange of food Yes, they talk about disease. I'm sure they do, but but really concentrating on the food and the cultural diffusion and the animals and this really nice look at the exploration. Well, that's that's elementary school, and they need to do that. They need to you know keep you guys you know smiling instead of crying. What I'm going to do is I'm going to talk to you about the realities of it through the transatlantic slave trade. This is this is cultural diffusion gone bad. Okay, this is the nastiness of greed. This is what we talk about when we talk about people who have dehumanized other people. This is the nastiness that we see. We can refer to it as the triangular trade. Basically what happens is Europeans will take slaves from Africa, transport them to the New World, and make them work on, on fields, either growing crops or in mines, you know, trying to get the, the gold and silver out. Um, although natives really did a lot of mining, the Africans did a lot of the, the food production, molasses, etc. Right. So uh, we estimate that 11 million people are going to be sent across what is called a Middle Passage, this place from Africa across to the New World, the Middle Passage. And the way that they did it is just, it's just horrendous. Man. Uh, forever damaged Africa would be after this because we took so many of the people. So this is the triangular system that is set up. 
A lot of what Europe sent down to Africa would be rum to keep the warlords of Africa satiated and happy, and a lot of guns uh, would be sent down there actually to keep um, some of the African tribes, you know, happy uh, and allow them to destroy other tribes they did not like. We use a divide and conquer strategy in Africa, just like we did in India. Um, when I'm talking about we, I'm talking about the Europeans, and I probably shouldn't say we. Okay, keep moving. So, um, pushing the slaves from Africa into, into North America, and those slaves would then work on the plantations, and the plantations would produce sugar, tobacco, cotton, which would be exported to Europe, and then eventually we'll talk about the Industrial Revolution and how those things sort of factor in. But for now, knowing this trade would make me a happy global teacher, and not forgetting it would make me an even happier one. Here is the uh, the way that they pack the slaves. So these are people, okay? If you look really closely, and please do look really closely, okay? This is the way they pack the people. Like, you know, just dehumanization to the 10th degree. It's it's horrendous. They just lay them down and, and force them to be on top of one another. And they let them go to the bathroom right where they are. And um, they, they are just trying to get as many people as they can, maximize the profits. And um, it's just... Uh, I want to change this slide now. Um, and when they uh, bring the Africans over, they have a system in place. And the Spanish develop a very concrete system. And the system that they have is, um, is built upon Spanish blood. Okay, that's how the system is built. So the more Spanish blood you have, the better off you're going to be in the society. Now, when you understand society in Spain, you need to understand who the Spanish are. So when I say Spain, you should say... Catholic, right? That has got to be in your brain because Catholicism runs Spain and it's going to develop. So this way, the church has a lot of power over in Latin America. In fact, it really still does to this day. There's really strong Catholic roots over there. So to remember the system, I gave you a little mnemonic. It's called Please Chew M&M's not apples. Please chew M&M's, not apples. Number one is the Peninsulares. They are from the Peninsula of Spain, okay? They are full-blooded Spaniards born in Spain. The Creoles are their sons or daughters that are born in Latin America. So if you are a peninsulare and then you come over and you settle with a little family, okay, and you have a little boy or girl, they are a Creole, okay? Even though they have full blood, it's where they are born that makes them a Creole. That's going to set up for some inequality that's going to anger those Creoles later on. In fact, the Creole class is going to be the revolutionaries of Latin America, which is pretty cool. Uh, the mestizos and the mulattoes, okay, the mestizos is a mix of the native and Spanish blood. The mulattoes are a mix of African and Spanish blood. It is sometimes consensual and oftentimes not, and, and that's the nastiness of a system that relies on slavery, uh, of violence, and brutality to keep people in line and in check, okay? Um, the system that they develop is called the encomienda, and the encomienda, basically conquistadors are given land through either a peninsulare or through the crown itself, and with that land grant, they can demand that natives work the land for them. They just demand it. That's what it is. Sometimes they would give them, like, you know, the, the Catholic faith as a as a wonderful, you know, sort of, like, trophy for, for all this hard work. Um, but most of the time, these natives were dying in record numbers because they the smallpox epidemic was so bad. I mean, PBS, Guns, Germs, and Steel, well-respected documentary out there, is talking about you know something on the on the toll of 20 million people may have died after 1492. So I'm talking like you know the 1500s. That's up to 95 percent of the population of America. And of course, we don't have like you know perfect numbers, but if if it's 90 or 95 percent of the people that are dead after the landing of the of the Spaniards and, and the Europeans, that is just absolutely horrific, absolutely horrific. And while smallpox is doing a lot of it, you know, remember the guns and remember the steel. You know, the Europeans are doing a lot of this as well. Okay, so this triangle trade is is going to is speed up as the natives die in record numbers and i know this is a really morbid thing to say but you got to hear it this is this is the ugliness of it the transatlantic slave trade the triangle trade that brings the slaves over is going to increase steadily and the reason for that is is that the natives are dying in such record numbers the Europeans can't keep up with it, and they don't want to work the land themselves, you know, heaven forbid, right? And so they're importing Africans to sort of fill the void of all of these natives dying. And so that's why slavery is going to expand so dramatically. It's, it's in direct reaction to the fact that the natives just, they're just dying in such record numbers. They, they have nothing they can do about it, um, you know, besides maybe leaving, right? Um, but we know they're not going to do that. So 
uh, with, with all of this, what I've done for you is I've set up and established the context for which the birth of the modern world has, has been born. And next year we'll talk about absolute monarchs and we'll talk about how this transatlantic slave trade was going to lead to strong monarchies and, and where all this wealth is siphoned off and spread into Europe and how that affects everything. We'll talk about how new ideas are going to form. People start to look at this system and say, we need new ways of government because this is wrong. We don't treat people this way. Revolutions are going to occur. And it becomes a heavy moving, fast moving curriculum with so many good stories that I've got to teach you and some sad ones to, to, to sort of fill the void. But um, suffice it to say, I hope this video helps you. Um, remember, this is global history and geography. Thank you, Leonidas, and have a great day, guys.